It was such an incredible party, genuinely, if I had to pick out the most happy and wonderful moments of my life, that Halloween party would have been one of them. That's why it hurts so much to remember it. It makes me want to break down crying. Whenever I think about the terrible, awful thing that happened right under our noses and how none of us even noticed, it feels so obvious. Looking back on it now, hindsight is 2020, I suppose. I wouldn't say I'm a particularly unsocial person. I think I get along with people quite well once I've gotten to know them. But something about making that first step of initial contact just always seemed so difficult. I always felt incredibly awkward being introduced to strangers. And while I can mask that discomfort fairly well, it does mean that I tend to adopt a slightly stilted and formal attitude whenever I'm meeting new people. As a consequence, and also in part due to the pandemic, much of my socializing for the past few years has been online. The awkwardness is still there of course, but it feels so much less uncomfortable when the people I am being introduced to are just text on a screen. However, this does mean that most of my friends tend to live quite far away. A handful of them do live within about an hour's drive of me, so we tend to hang out whenever possible. At least we used to before the party. Nowadays it just feels wrong. It was on one such meetup with three friends of mine that we discussed the possibility of a throwing a big party of some sort. We all navigated the same general social circles and we had considered for a while inviting down the myriad online friends we had acquired over the years, at least the ones we trusted. It was I who suggested we host the party on Halloween. From there the discussion swiftly turned to themes, since what kind of Halloween party wouldn't have a theme? Jessica suggested that we host something inspired by mythology and ancient history. She had always been quite interested in legends, myths, and classical literature of all kinds, and I recall fondly our discussions of Beowulf and the romance of the Three Kingdoms. As much as I would have liked to indulge her, the others pointed out it could be somewhat of a niche topic, and so the discussion continued. Sadie, Jessica's girlfriend, suggested something themed off of horror films. Sadie had, partially at my encouragement, been on a bit of a horror movie kick as of late, and we had all enjoyed spending time watching some of the old classics together. It seemed like a solid theme, and Jessica and I were almost set to agree on it, but it was then that Jake suggested his idea. In any given queer friend group, there is typically one straight member who has been deemed safe by the others. Jake was that friend. We all considered him trustworthy and never really had to worry about him putting his foot in his mouth. Whenever the conversation veered towards a rainbow hue, I had half expected Jake to suggest a historical theme given his degree in military history, but instead he advised that we go for a traditional sort of Halloween party, bobbing for apples, carving pumpkins, that sort of thing. The rest of us immediately agreed this would be the best course of action. Not only would it mean that none of the attendees would have to adjust their costumes for the occasion, but also none of us had ever actually attended such an event, and the novelty of something simultaneously nostalgic yet alien was the perfect combination. Instantly there was discussion of activities, decorations, and whether or not we should pull together our funds to get a fog machine. Now, obviously the four of us didn't plan out the entire party in one night. We still had to figure out who we trusted well enough to give Jessica's address to, send out invitation, and even put up a couple of online fundraisers to try and get plane tickets for some of our more distant friends. Over the months that this process took we soon found that what had started out as mere idle discussion was rapidly taking shape into what seemed would be a rather excellent celebration. Now, each of us were to contribute some sort of activity that we would watch over and purchase the necessary supplies for. Sadie's medical background gave her the rather ghoulish idea, setting up a pumpkin carving table themed after an autopsy, which while strictly speaking wasn't traditional, fit so well with the whole aesthetic of the party that we all found it delightful. Jessica set about acquiring an old style wooden barrel for the purpose of bobbing for apples, putting her artistic skills to good use with paintings of various Halloween spooks on the sides of it. My idea was somewhat silly but still wound up being put to use. I couldn't find if the game had a real name or if it was just called the mirror game, but I'd heard it allege that if you stared at your own face in the mirror for long enough your mind would distort the image in a rather frightful manner. So I was going to set up the bathroom with candles and a chair. The lights turned off. Jake decided he was going to set up a game of dead man's brains. If you've ever read scary stories to tell in the dark, you've probably heard of this game. 
You set up a series of boxes with bits of cloth loosely covering the opening and place within each box some nasty object that feels like the body part of a dead man. Peeled grapes for eyes, a bowl of diluted ketchup for blood, a mushy tomato for the titular brain, etc. There was a sort of pseudo poem that was supposed to go along with it, but Jake didn't really care to stick too close to the traditional version. He said he would put his own twist on it. We all thought it was a great idea and that it fit the theme perfectly. Jake even went about making some custom boxes for the affair, each labeled with the body part in question, deciding that his version would consist of eyeballs, guts, heart, fingers, and of course, the titular brains. The months until the party turned into weeks, then days, until finally it was time for the night itself. I arrived early along with Sadie so we could set up our activities in advance of the guests, but Jake was nowhere to be found. We texted him, but received no response, which was a bit worrying, but we tried to work around it, assuming that something had come up that was occupying his attention for a bit. In terms of costumes, Sadie and Jessica had decided to go as Carmilla and Laura from Carmilla. We had recently watched the film Dracula's Daughter, which was loosely inspired by the novella, and while the film itself was so-so, it had inspired the two of them to read the source material, which they quite enjoyed. Given Sadie's relative short stature in comparison to Jessica, it was somewhat amusing to observe a Carmilla, who would need a step stool in order to successfully suck out her victim's blood. As for me, I had chosen to dress as the witch Keziah Mason from Lovecraft's Tale Dreams in the Witch House. It was a simple matter of getting some Puritan-esque clothes, a ragged gray shawl, and a small toy rat with the bearded face of an action figure swapped for the head. All in all, I thought the effect was rather good, though I didn't go to the effort of attempting to age myself with makeup. Jessica's apple bobbing station and Sadie's pumpkin autopsy table were set up quickly and I went about preparing all the necessary alterations to the bathroom. At this point, the first guests were expected to arrive and we were all growing increasingly concerned by Jake's continued absence. We tried calling him, but were directed straight to voicemail. Of the four of us, Jake was usually the most punctual, so this was a very strange change of character. We decided we would have to start without him, not that we had much choice in the matter. As soon as we had said this, our first guests began to pour in. Our first visitors of the evening were Ashley and Dawn, fresh from their honeymoon in British Columbia. Dawn seemed dressed like something out of a World War II propaganda poster with a plaid shirt an open welding mask. Ashley's costume seemed to be a character out of some cartoon or video game which I wasn't familiar with. Pink hair and a punk style with large mechanical boxing gloves of some sort. Regardless of my unfamiliarity with the subject matter, the costume did seem to be quite well made and despite the lack of matching with regards to their costumes, the two of them made quite the cute couple. We had only just managed to finish introductions when Sock and his boyfriend arrived next. Sock is quite the artist, with talents and more mediums than I can count. One of those people who is less a jack of all trades and more a master of all trades. It seemed he had turned his artistic skills towards papier mash most recently, as the costume he wore seemed primarily made using the technique. It was some sort of monstrous beast, all fangs, claws, and scaly skin, and though it was quite impressive, I couldn't quite discern if it was meant to reference something else or if it was an original creation of Sock's. Sock's boyfriend, whose name I can never recall, simply wore a cheap mad scientist outfit, complete with goggles and long black gloves. He was a rather short, anxious gentleman, a mycologist by trade if I recall correctly, and while he did seem to enjoy himself, as the evening progressed, he tended to just hover around his boyfriend nervously. Next came Carlos and Elizabeth, the two of them sharing a ride to save money. Both had just landed after extremely long flights, Carlos from Brazil and Elizabeth from France, and it was clear from their bleary eyes and occasionally spacey looks that they were jet lagged to hell and back. Carlos hadn't really had time to get any sort of costume ready, so simply wore some nice tweeds and a sign hanging from his neck reading I am a human puppet. Elizabeth meanwhile had managed to put on some clown makeup. In spite of their tiredness, the two of them seemed to perk up quite quickly as this was the first time any of us had the opportunity to meet up in person with them and our enthusiasm was infectious. Second to last arrived Astra, clad in the garb of a Napoleonic soldier and I knew even without asking that every aspect of the uniform was sure to be as accurate as possible. 
Within minutes of her arrival, Astra, Carlos, and Elizabeth were instantly locked in conversation regarding the intricacies of lightweight tabletop role-playing game design, a topic they continued to discuss for much of the party. Finally, after every other guest had long since made their way to the party, did Jake show up? There was a knock upon Jessica's thick wooden door, and since everyone else was otherwise occupied in conversation, I went and answered. I found myself standing face to face with a gas-masked infantryman of the Great War, complete with Brody helmet, and a replica Webley revolver which I lent him. Next to him were a series of wooden boxes. I greeted him with a hug, which he responded with silently and stiffly. Something was wrong, but I didn't know what. He pressed a piece of folded up paper into my hand, which I read immediately. It said, sorry for being late, couldn't find the card for the train, I've got a cold, and I've lost my voice. I'll probably have to leave early, but I figured I should at least show up as long as I can. Would have told you earlier, but my phone stopped working. I think the battery gave out. I apologized profusely for the hardships he had experienced and ushered him into the house to the cheers of our friends, carrying the boxes he had brought for him. Each box was made of dark stained wood with an opening covered in black cloth with a label burned above the opening stating which body part was contained within each one. It was really quite impressive and I complimented Jake on his handiwork, to which he simply nodded. I helped him set up the game of dead man's brains on the table we had set aside for it, and the rest of the party continued as planned, though the distinctive absence of Jake's voice was noticeable. Everything about the party was perfect. Legitimately, I do not think I have ever had a happier occasion in my entire life. There was laughter, jokes, at some point or another Ashley, and Dawn broke out some card games. Elizabeth ran a quick session of a horror TTRPG of her own design. It was a truly magical evening. The theme of the classic Halloween party didn't go unobserved either. Plenty of time was spent bobbing for apples, staring into the mirror, by candlelight, carving pumpkins, and everyone in the party adored Jake's rendition of Dead Man's Brains. He accepted each compliment with a polite nod and a tip of his helmet. There were five boxes, labeled eyes, guts, fingers, heart, and finally, brain. I've always been somewhat squeamish when it came to rotten fruit, raw meat, and other such inedible foodstuffs, and what I felt in those boxes quickly triggered that latent disgust. I only managed to get to guts before I had to dip out, laughingly explaining that I would vomit if I had to undergo the whole thing. There were many jokes about me being scared, but I wasn't pressured into doing the rest of it. We had already planned to make the party into a sleepover, since we didn't expect anyone to shell out the money for a hotel. As the evening wound down, out came the air mattresses and pillows. As soon as it was clear that the more active part of the evening was coming to a close, Jake quietly excused himself, handing a note to Jessica thanking her for hosting the party. We all gave our fondest farewells to them, each of us hugging him in turn, and he left with a final wave and a cheerful salute. They all slept soundly that night, happy from the company of friends, and tired from a night of childlike, innocent fun. It was such a perfect party, and despite what I know now, I still find myself reliving that night over and over in my head, remembering how happy and content I felt. Everything changed in the morning. I had woken up earlier than usual, nose wrinkling due to an unfamiliar stench. I got up to investigate more intent on getting rid of it so I could go back to sleep than getting up for the day proper. The smell came from the boxes, a rotten, sickly odor, the scent of meat just beginning to spoil. I remember mentally kicking myself for not reminding Jake to take them with him. When he left, I put on a pair of rubber gloves and reached inside, trying not to gag. I started with the box labeled eyes. I must have woken up the whole neighborhood with my screaming. The police were there within 15 minutes to take our testimony. They kept asking everyone for a description of the suspect, what he looked like, and we just had to shake our heads and tell them we didn't know, that we couldn't tell who he was underneath the gas mask. Hell, we didn't even know if he was a he. We didn't see their face after all. They took the eyes, the intestines, the severed fingers, the heart, and the severed head with the top of the skull neatly removed as evidence, but I imagine Jake's family were swiftly given custody of the remains shortly afterwards. It's not like forensics would be able to get any usable fingerprints off of them, given how many of us had touched them. 